Hi, my name is Jamie Paul, and welcome to Good Night Flagstaff. I'm one of the volunteers here um, with the Literacy Center and Good Night Flagstaff, and I love to read out loud. I love to share books with people, and I'm excited to be reading to you from Chapter 15 of The Last Battle, which is Book 7 of the Chronicles of Narnia series by C.S. Lewis. Thank you for tuning in. You can find a new chapter from one of our favorite family-friendly books at 8 p.m. each weeknight on the <laughs> I'm sorry on the Literacy Center's YouTube channel and on Crater Radio, a local online radio station. The previous chapter is replayed on Crater Radio each weeknight at about 7:45, just before the new chapter airs. You can also listen to all previous Goodnight Flagstaff recordings on YouTube. We are currently reading. Obviously, the Chronicles of Narnia. We've been doing that for quite a while. We are almost to the end of book seven. Tomorrow, Jill Valencia is going to read the final chapter. It's very, very exciting. And then we'll be doing Rebecca Roanhorse's Race to the Sun starting next week. So get ready. Please email us if you'd like to join our team of readers and connect with the community through stories. All ages are welcome. We'd love to have more kids reading, um, young people, older people, anyone who wants to read. We want to hear you read. Our email is goodnightflagstaff at gmail.com. So just shoot us an email if you want to be added to our volunteer list and we'll sign you up for a day. You just record your chapter at home using your voice memo app or something fancier if you want and send it in and we put it up on the right date. So no pressure. Join us. Last time we read together, it was time for Aslan to go to work. Father Time had awoken. As all the animals and people made their way through the door, some of them went to the left, never to be seen again, while others headed off to the right to head further up and further in. After the door had been shut, the dogs found the scent of one lone calamine. And now, Chapter 15. Further up and further in. No, O warlike kings, said Emmeth, and you, O ladies, whose beauty illuminates the universe, that I am Emmeth, the seventh son of Harpa Tarkan of the city of Teheshvan, westward beyond the desert. I came lately into Narnia with nine and twenty others under the command of Rishta Tarkan. Now, when I first heard that we would march upon Narnia, I rejoiced. For I had heard many things of your land and desired greatly to meet you in battle. But when I found that we were to go in disguise as merchants, which is this shameful dress for a warrior and the son of a Tarkan, and to work by lies and trickery, then my joy departed from me. And most of all, when I found we must wait upon a monkey, and when it began to be said that Tosh and Aslan were one, then the world became dark in my eyes. For always since I was a boy, I have served Tosh, and my great desire was to know more of him, and, if it might be, to look upon his face. But the name of Aslan was hateful to me. And as you have seen, we were called together outside the straw-roofed hovel, night after night, and the fire was kindled, and the ape brought forth out of the hovel something upon four legs that I could not well see. And the people and the beasts bowed down and did honor to it. But I thought the Tarkan is deceived by the ape, for this thing that comes out of the stable is neither Tosh nor any other god. But when I watched the Tarkan's face and marked every word that he said to the monkey, then I changed my mind, for I saw that the Tarkan did not believe in it himself. And then I understood that he did not believe in Tosh at all, for if he had, how could he dare to mock him? When I understood this, a great rage fell upon me, and I wondered that the true Tosh did not strike down both the monkey and the Tarkan with the fire from heaven. Nevertheless, I hid my anger and held my tongue and waited to see how it would end. But last night, as some of you know, the monkey brought forth not the yellow thing, but said that all who desired to look upon Tashlin, for as they mixed the two words to pretend that they were all one, must pass one by one into the hovel. And I said to myself, Doubtless, this is some deception. But when the cat had gone in and had come out again in a madness of terror, then I said to myself, Surely the true Tosh, whom they called on without knowledge or belief, has now come among us and will avenge himself. 
And though my heart was turned into water inside me because of the greatness and terror of Tosh, yet my desire was stronger than my fear, and I put force upon my knees to stay them from trembling, and on my teeth that they should not chatter, and resolved to look upon the face of Tosh, and though he would slay me. So I offered myself to go into the hovel, and the Tarkan, though unwillingly, let me go. As soon as I had gone through the door, the first wonder was that I found myself in this great sunlight, as we all are now, though the inside of the hovel had looked dark from outside. But I had no time to marvel at this, for immediately I was forced to fight for my head against one of our own men. As soon as I saw him, I understood that the monkey and the Tarkan had set him there to slay any who came in, if we were not in their secrets, so that this man also was a liar and a mocker and no true servant of Tosh. I had the better will to fight him, and having slain the villain, I cast him out behind me through the door. Then I looked about me, and saw the sky and the wide lands, and smelled the sweetness. And I said, By the gods, this is a pleasant place, and maybe that I am come into the country of Tosh. And I began to journey into the strange country, and to seek him. So I went over much grass and many flowers, and among all kinds of wholesome and delectable trees, till, lo, in a narrow place between two rocks, there came to meet me a great lion. The speed of him was like the ostrich, and his size was like an elephant. His hair was like pure gold, and the brightness of his eyes like gold that is liquid in the furnace. He was more terrible than the flaming mountain of Lagor, and in beauty he surpassed all that is in the world, even as the rose in bloom surpasses the dust of the desert. Then I fell at his feet and thought, surely this is the hour of death, for the lion, who is worthy of all honor, will know that I have served Tosh all my days and not him. Nevertheless, it is better to see the lion and die than to be Tizrak of the world and live and not have seen him. But the glorious one bent down his golden head and touched my forehead with his tongue and said, Son, you are welcome. But I said, Alas, Lord, I am no son of thine, but the servant of Tosh. He answered, Child, all the service thou hast done to Tosh, I account as service done to me. Then by reason of my great desire for wisdom and understanding, I overcame my fear and questioned the glorious one and said, Lord, is it then true, as the ape said, that thou and Tosh are one? The lion growled so that the earth shook, but his wrath was not against me, and said, It is false, not because he and I are one, but because we are opposites. I take to me the services which thou hast done to him, for I and he are of such different kinds that no service which is vile can be done to me, and none which is not vile can be done to him. Therefore, if any man swear by Tosh and keep his oath for the oath's sake, it is by me that he is truly sworn, though he know it not. And it is I who reward him. And if any man do a cruelty in my name, then, though he says in the name of Aslan, it is Tosh whom he serves, and by Tosh his deed is accepted. Dost thou understand, child? I said. Lord, thou knowest how much I understand. But I said also, for the truth constrained me. Yet I have been seeking Tosh all my days. Beloved, said the glorious one, unless the desire had been for me, thou wouldst not have sought so long and so truly, for all find what they truly seek. Then he breathed upon me and took away the trembling from my limbs and caused me to stand upon my feet. And after that he said, Not much, but that we should meet again, and I must go further up and further in. Then he turned, then he turned him about in a storm and flurry of gold and was gone suddenly. And since then, O oh kings and ladies, I have been wondering to find him, and my happiness is so great that it even weakens me like a wound. And this is the marble of marvels, that he called me beloved, me who am but a dog. Hey, what's that? said one of the dogs. Sir, said Emmeth, it is but a fashion of speech which we have in Calerman. Well, I can't say it's one I like very much, said the dog. He doesn't mean any harm, said an older dog. After all, we call our puppies boys when they don't behave properly. So we do, said the first dog. Or girls. Shh, said the old dog. That's not a nice word to use. Remember where you are. Look, said Jill suddenly. Someone was coming rather timidly to meet them. A graceful creature on four feet, all silvery gray. And they stared at him for a whole ten seconds before five or six voices said all at once, Why, it's old Puzzle! 
They had never seen him by daylight with the lion skin off, and it made an extraordinary difference. He was himself now, a beautiful donkey with such a soft gray coat and such a gentle, honest face that if you had seen him, you would have done just what Jill and Lucy did. Rush forward and put your arms around his neck and kissed his nose and stroked his ears. When they asked him where he had been, he said he had come in at the door along with all the other creatures, but he had, well, to tell the truth, he had been keeping out of their way as much as he could and out of Aslan's way for the sight of the real lion had made him so ashamed of all the nonsense about dressing up in a lion skin that he did not know how to look anyone in the face. But when he saw that all his friends were going away westward, and after he had a mouthful or so of grass, and I've never tasted such good grass in my life, said Puzzle, he plucked up his courage and followed. But what I'll do if I really have to meet Aslan, I'm sure I don't know, he added. You'll find it will be all right when you really do, said Queen Lucy. Then they all went forward together, always westward, for that seemed to be the direction Aslan had meant when he cried out, Further up and further in! Many creatures were slowly moving the same way, but that grassy country was very wide and there was no crowding. It still seemed to be early and the morning freshness was in the air. They kept on stopping to look round and to look behind them, partly because it was so beautiful, but partly also because there was something about it which they could not understand. Peter, said Lucy, where is this, do you suppose? I don't know, said the High King. It reminds me of somewhere, but I can't give it a name. Could it be somewhere we once stayed for a holiday when we were very, very small? It would have to have been a jolly good holiday, said Eustace. I bet there isn't a country like this anywhere in our world. Look at the colors. You couldn't get a blue like that blue on these mountains in our world. Is it not Aslan's country, said Tyrion? Not like Aslan's country on top of that mountain beyond the eastern end of the world, said Jill. I've been there. If you ask me, said Edmund, it's like somewhere in the Narnian world. Look at those mountains ahead, and the big ice mountains beyond them. Surely they're rather like the mountains we used to see from Narnia, the ones up westward beyond the waterfall. Yeah, so they are, said Peter, only these are bigger. I don't think those ones are so very like anything in Narnia, said Lucy. But look there, she pointed southward to their left, and everyone stopped and turned to look. Those hills, said Lucy, the nice woody ones and the blue ones behind, aren't they very like the southern border of Narnia? Like, cried Edmund after a moment's silence. Why, they're exactly like. Look, there's Mount Pyre with his forked head, and there's the pass into Archenland and everything. And yet, they're not like, said Lucy. They're different. They have more colors on them, and they look further away than I remember, and they're more... More, oh, I don't know. More like the real thing, said the Lord Diggory softly. Suddenly, Farsight the eagle spread his wings, soared thirty or forty feet up in the air, circled round, and then alighted on the ground. Kings and queens, he cried, we have all been blind. We are only beginning to see where we are. From up there I have seen it all. Ettensmuir, Beaver's Dam, the Great River, and Caraparavel still shining on the edge of the Eastern Sea. Narnia is not dead. This is Narnia. But how can it be, said Peter, for Aslan told us older ones that we should never return to Narnia, and here we are. Yes, said Eustace, and we saw it all destroyed and the sun put out. And it's all so different, said Lucy. The eagle is right, said Lord Diggory. Listen, Peter, when Aslan said you could never go back to Narnia, he meant the Narnia you were thinking of. But that was not the real Narnia. That had a beginning and an end. It was only a shadow or a copy of the real Narnia, which has always been here and always will be here, just as our own world, England and all, is only a shadow or copy of something in Aslan's real world. You need not mourn over Narnia, Lucy. All of the old Narnia that mattered, all the dear creatures, have been drawn into the real Narnia through the door. And of course, it is different, as different as a real thing is from a shadow or as waking life is from a dream. His voice stirred everyone like a trumpet as he spoke these words. But when he added under his breath, 
It's all in Plato. All in Plato, bless me. What do they teach them at these schools? The older ones laughed. It was so exactly like the sort of thing they had heard him say long ago in the other world, where his beard was gray instead of golden. He knew why they were laughing and joined in to laugh himself. But very quickly, they all became grave again. For as you know, there is a kind of happiness and wonder that makes you serious. It is too good to waste on jokes. It is hard to explain how this sunlit land was different from the old Narnia, as it would be to tell you how the fruits of that country taste. Perhaps you will get some idea of it if you think like this. You may have been in a room in which there was a window that looked out on a lovely bay of the sea or a green valley that wound away among mountains. And in the wall of that room, opposite to the window, there may have been a looking glass. And as you turned away from the window, you suddenly caught sight of that sea or that valley all over again in the looking glass. And the sea in the mirror or the valley in the mirror were in one sense just the same as the real ones. Yet at the same time, they were somehow different. Deeper, more wonderful, more like places in a story. In a story you have never heard but very much want to know. The difference between the old Narnia and the new Narnia was like that. The new one was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked as if it meant more. I can't describe it any better than that. If you ever get there, you will know what I mean. It was the unicorn who summed up what everyone was feeling. He stamped his right forehoof on the ground and neighed and then cried, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. The reason why we loved the old Narnia is that it sometimes looked a little like this. Bree, come further up, come further in. Nay. He shook his mane and sprang forward into a great gallop. A unicorn's gallop, which, in our world, would have carried him out of sight in a few moments. But now a most strange thing happened. Everyone else began to run, and they found, to their astonishment, that they could keep up with him. Not only the dogs and the humans, but even fat little puzzle the donkey, and short-legged Pagan the dwarf. The air flew in their faces as if they were driving fast in a car without a windshield. The country flew past as if they were seeing it from the windows of an express train. Faster and faster they raced, but no one got hot or tired or out of breath. That is all for chapter 15. Join us tomorrow for chapter 16 called Farewell to Shadowlands. Good night, Flagstaff.